Cholecystitis is an acute or chronic inflammation of the gallbladder. Cholelithiasis is the presence of calculi or gallstones within the gallbladder or in the biliary system. The biliary system is composed of the gallbladder, the biliary circulation, and the ductal system. Bile, produced in the liver, is transported via the left and right hepatic ducts to the gallbladder. The gallbladder acts as a reservoir for bile, and it concentrates bile by absorbing water and salts. When a person ingests fats, the gallbladder releases bile into the duodenum through the sphincter of Adi. Bile is a digestive juice, and it also promotes peristalsis. Bile pigments, derived from hemoglobin, impart a brown color to intestinal contents and feces. Abnormalities that interfere with the flow of bile produce jaundice. The restriction of the flow of bile can also produce gallstones. Gallstones can form in the gallbladder, the common bile duct, and the duodenum. There are two types of gallstones, pigment stones that are made of bile pigments and cholesterol stones. People at most risk for cholecystitis or cholelithiasis are obese women who have several children, take oral contraceptives or estrogens, eat a fatty diet and are of Caucasian or Hispanic origin. It is helpful to remember the risk factors for cholecystitis by these five Fs. Fair, 40, female, fertile, and fatty diet. There may also be a family history of gallbladder disease. Clients experience different signs and symptoms, depending on whether their condition is acute or chronic, or involves the presence of gallstones. With acute cholecystitis, the symptoms are epigastric discomfort after meals, biliary colic, severe right upper gastric pain radiating to the back or the right shoulder, high fever due to inflammation of the gallbladder, nausea and vomiting and flatulence, bloating and belching. With chronic cholecystitis, the symptoms are vague abdominal pains, low-grade fever, jaundice, clay-colored stools due to lack of bile pigmentation, steatorrhea, or fat in the stool, dark urine, and fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies. That's vitamins A, D, E, and K. With cholelithiasis, the symptoms are abdominal pain, varying with the size and location of the gallstones, and the degree of obstruction, intolerance to fatty foods, severe biliary colic with diaphoresis, tachycardia, and pallor, a sausage-shaped mass in the upper abdominal quadrant, and jaundice when the bile ducts are obstructed by stones. Cholecystitis is diagnosed on the basis of laboratory studies, gallbladder ultrasound studies, and radionuclide imaging. Clients may have elevated serum liver enzymes, an elevated leukocyte count caused by the inflammation of the gallbladder, and in those who are jaundiced, elevated bilirubin levels. Clients might also have a positive Murphy's sign, that is, when the examiner places a hand at the costal margin in the right upper abdominal quadrant and asks them to inhale deeply. They stop before the inhalation is complete because of intense pain. When the nurse palpates the right subcostal area over the inflamed gallbladder, the client feels extreme pain on inspiration. Gallstones are identified in clients who have cholelithiasis on an x-ray or an ultrasound image. Cholangiography combines radiography and a contrast medium, a dye, to outline the biliary tract. Endoscopic retrograde cholangiopangreatography, ERCP, identifies stones that are located in the common bile duct. During ERCP, a radiopaque dye is inserted through a cannula into the main bile duct, and then several x-rays are taken. In preparation for ERCP, ask the client about any known allergies or sensitivities to x-ray dye. Be sure the client has signed a consent form. On the night before the procedure, instruct the client to take nothing by mouth after midnight. Advise the client that a sedative will be administered during the procedure by IV infusion. Following ERCP, take the client's vital signs every 15 minutes until they are stable. Be sure the client receives nothing by mouth until the gag reflex returns. Complications that can develop following ERCP include perforation, sepsis, and pancreatitis. Instruct the client to report abdominal pain, fever, nausea, or vomiting to the primary care provider immediately. What are the nursing diagnoses for clients who have cholecystitis or cholelithiasis? Pain related to the passage of gallstones. Nausea and emesis related to blockage of the flow of bile. Altered nutrition, less than body requirements related to nausea and vomiting and potential complications of cholecystectomy, like infection or hemorrhage.
Medical management for clients who have cholecystitis includes a low-fat, high-protein, high-carbohydrate diet. The diet should be low in calories to promote weight loss. Clients may require supplements of fat-soluble vitamins to compensate for reduced absorption. However, some clients may feel too nauseated to eat. NPO, nasogastric suction, and IV infusions may be ordered for clients who are vomiting. Pain relief is essential. Place the client in a low Fowler's position for comfort and teach her to splint the abdomen. Administer analgesics and anticholinergics for pain. Demerol is the analgesic drug of choice because it causes fewer painful spasms of the sphincter of Audi than morphine sulfate does. Traditionally, morphine has not been administered. Clients who have gallstones may benefit from bile acid therapy, which involves administering oral bile salts to dissolve the stones. Clients may also be given cholesterol-lowering agents that help to reduce the formation of cholesterol stones. When conservative therapy fails to correct cholelithiasis, extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy may be used to shatter the gallstones. This non-invasive procedure uses powerful, high-pressure sound waves to break the stones into small pieces that can pass through the common bile duct into the duodenum. Following extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, make sure you assess the client for increased pain, signs of internal bleeding, and shock. Cholecystitis and cholelithiasis can also be treated surgically. Biliary tract surgery is the most common operative procedure performed on older adults. Cholecystectomy is defined as the removal of the gallbladder. Laparoscopic cholecystectomy is the preferred procedure, and it is performed on an outpatient basis for 80% of clients who have gallbladder disease. The client's abdomen is filled with carbon dioxide to displace the abdominal organs so that they can be more easily viewed on a video screen. The surgeon makes several small puncture wounds in the abdomen, inserts the laparoscope, and dissects the gallbladder with a laser, and then removes it. There is no special preoperative care. The client should ambulate as soon as possible after surgery to promote absorption of the carbon dioxide that remains in the abdomen. Open abdominal cholecystectomy is the traditional procedure, and it is performed when the gallbladder is very distended and inflamed, or contains large, multiple stones. During cholecystectomy, the surgeon will insert a Penrose drain to remove serosanguineous fluid. The surgeon might also explore the common bile duct. A T-tube is inserted to remove gallstones, ensure patency of the duct, and drain bile. Following abdominal cholecystectomy, provide the client with routine postoperative care. Observe the client for bleeding, infection, and respiratory complications, such as pneumonia, thrombophlebitis, and dehydration. If a T-tube is in place, what precautions must you always follow? Make sure to keep the T-tube drainage bag below the level of the suture line to prevent backflow of bile, and never clamp the T-tube without the surgeon's order. In preparation for discharge following abdominal cholecystectomy, provide the client with the following instructions. Inspect the abdominal incision every day for redness, tenderness, or swelling. Report any signs of infection or elevated temperature to the health care provider immediately. Open and empty the tea bag every day as instructed, and change the dressing. Keep the tea tube drainage bag free of kinks and below the level of the suture line. Wear loose fitting clothes to prevent irritation of the wound. Take showers instead of baths to reduce the risk of infecting the open wound. Report excessive or foul smelling drainage to the health care provider. Avoid lifting heavy objects to prevent straining or pressure on the wound site. Do not drive for six weeks following the surgery. Reduce dietary fat by avoiding rich sauces, gravies, desserts, and fried foods. Follow the American Diabetes Association's or the American Heart Association's guidelines for planning a low-fat diet. And finally, make an appointment for a follow-up cholangiogram.